Welcome to Keep the Game Beautiful podcast. Each week, I highlight incredible people who are doing amazing things in soccer, the beautiful game. I'm Anna Turi, your host. Thank you for listening. Before I get into today's episode, I wanted to thank Addie and Tiff at Duke Tig for an awesome Duke Tig FC member package. It's always super exciting to get a package in the mail, especially when it's with has new products to try out and provide feedback on. This podcast was a really fun opportunity for me to learn from a coach in my own community. Justin is a coach at the club I played at for the last year and a half, FC United in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. You never know it by meeting him because he is quite humble, but he's played among some of the top talent in the world as a former top-level athlete in South Africa. I really enjoyed learning about his journey and appreciated the sincerity of some of his answers. Above all, though, I really liked his messages about acceptance and helping individual players perform and find their best. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Today's guest is Justin Vorster. Justin was born in South Africa, which is one of the main reasons I wanted to bring him on today, to learn about his experience as a youth and pro player in a country that was sometimes divided. He has coached at many different levels, including youth levels, collegiately, and into the professional levels, and holds his A license. Right now, he's the technical director of FC United right here in Iowa. I had the chance to guest play on his team a few times last year. So, Justin, would you like to take a second and share a bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, Anna, first, firstly, thanks, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, I also enjoy uh, discussing, you know, obviously my past, and you know, I've I've grown up in different cultures uh, within the spectrum of Africa. Um, so I, I find it interesting talking about it and seeing just looking at the different aspects of um how how i've developed in in africa um as a player but then more as a coach here in the united states so i'm excited to be on uh be on the show that's for sure so on this podcast i always start with the same three questions so first what does the beautiful game mean to you <laughs> means everything to be honest with you i mean i've uh, i've grown up with it uh i played every day as a as a youth soccer player and then obviously uh moving into my la- the latter stages of my career um i've i researched the game i follow the game i watch pretty much nearly every league that's uh, broadcasted on tv or or i'm recording the games um and then obviously just the, the, the big thing is, is how it brings uh, different cultures together as well. I mean, the beautiful game is bringing cultures together. And, you know, when you think of, uh, I can go back to, you know, my times in South Africa. Uh, the, when we went through the transition period uh, in the early 90s, um, you know, Nelson Mandela was the president of the country at that, that particular point. We had the World Cup rugby on in 1995. Um, I'm talking about a different sport now, but that brought uh, the whole country together as one, uh, and they call it the Rainbow Nation in in South Africa, bringing all the colors together. Um, And it's most certainly did. And then a year later in 1996, we hosted the African Cup of Nations. You know, we had the formidable, formidable Tunisian side that were out there, they were probably between South Africa, Bafana, Bafana, and then Tunisia, and then some of the Cameroon and some of the, the greater nations were tipped to win it. And again, we won the African Cup of Nations. And again, that brought a, a country together. And that's, that's what it means to me is bringing, bringing the pieces together, the, the, the different classes, the cultures, uh, and, and, you know, that means a lot. It doesn't matter who you are, or what you are, you know. And then in 2010, which unfortunately I didn't make the World Cup in South Africa, but I did go after, again, brought a nation together, you know. So it's not just 
the beautiful game, but it, it's what what the game does off the field, the the cultures and the crowd, bringing crowds together and the excitement and you know just that's that that's what it inspires me as well. So yeah, hopefully that answers that particular question. What are actions or things you do to keep the game beautiful? Motivation, motivating myself to, to, to inspire young players to love the game by the way I coach and my demeanor when I coach, just aspiring the, the youngsters. I mean, it, the beautiful game, I, I can sit at a table in a coffee shop with three or four other coaches and we can rattle on for three hours about football and we will it's it whenever you're around coaches no matter what you know there might be two or three topics that you're talking about but football is the main topic you know we're always talking about it and trying to evolve as as coaches you know how do you encourage others to keep the game beautiful you know Everybody has their own way of motivating, uh, individual ways. I, I look at how I love the game, you know. Um, but like to motivate and encourage others is just, you know, talking about not just – we could talk about little things about great players, you know, but it's like if you were someone that – it's it's a, it's a case of like I can sit down with – a group, maybe some non, non-soccer non people, okay? And I could show them a YouTube video of the passion in a crowd at a, at a, dar- at a derby football match, you know? Um, or as you say, here in the States, a derby. I think you say derby here, yeah? Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, so actually showing them a video of a crowd and the passion and the singing. It, I think is enough to inspire anybody, really, when you when you think about it, you know. So let's just start. What was it like to grow up in South Africa? Well, I grew up in two parts of Africa. I grew up in Malawi, East Africa, where I um, uh, I grew up playing for youth clubs, high school, um, and then in South Africa. When I moved back to South Africa when I was nineteen years old, was I then started with a, a bigger club, you know, um, but it, it was, it was great. I, it was fun, you know, um, pl- playing with, in, in, in Malawi, East Africa, I was the only white guy in the team, you know, um, and I, I learned my, I learned through the beautiful game playing a style of football that was uh, from an African technical uh, technical mentality. Uh, so that was that's how I actually originally started playing and learning from my mentors back then that I played with. You know, so yeah, it was it was it was an interesting. Uh, uh, lifestyle that I would never, never change or take back or want, want anything different. You know, uh, I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. I had experiences playing on some uh, re- really bad soccer pitches, but it was, uh, uh, it was good, you know, and uh, it was, it was motivating and, and inspiring. I never, I hardly missed training when I was there as a kid. And, and I had to walk to training sometimes. <laughs> What do you find different with playing styles in South Africa and here in the States? You know, um, back when I played, it was the common 4-4-2. Um, you know, at times, get depending on your coach, let's get the ball forward in the opposing half as quickly as possible uh, and then put pressure on them in their half. Uh, we, we, we hardly really played out of the back. If a quick counterattack was on, we would. But it was really the goalkeeper would get the ball and look for a quick counterattack going forward by hitting the two strikers up front. But today, the playing style has changed. A lot of the systems are very, very familiar. And most of the clubs there, the professional clubs, the top ones, uh, they, 
they have a playing style that they will play out of the back, play through the lines, but it's all based on who they're playing against at the end of the day. But the, the style is, with systems and shapes, is, is up there with the rest of the world. What do you find different with the systems? Back then, like I said, uh, when we played, it was a 4-4-2 most of the time, or a 3-5-2 with a sweeper system. So you had, if the three at the back, you had two marking and one dropped off very deep in case the ball was flicked on, they could just clean it up. Um, the back pass rule when that changed was, you know, goalkeepers could pick it up if it was passed back to them. You know, so you know, that, that all changed, that when they came in with the back pass rule, that changed the whole spectrum of the game. You know, goalkeepers couldn't pick it up, they had to use their feet. Uh, so there was a, a massive change in the playing style there. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, it was, and, but nowadays the, the, when I go back and I watch games back home, the playing styles are, are pretty much the same here, but when you look at the professional game, it, it, the, the speed of actions aren't as quick as here. They play a very, over there, it's entertainment as well. So, for example, if a team's winning 2 0, they will dilly dally on the ball, not try and score. They'll just showboat now for the crowd. Um, and there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of YouTube videos around that will show that. But it, it, nowadays, they're getting a little more professional. The, the money in South Africa and professional football is is massive. Um, they are paying really good money, even more than the MLS here from what I've heard you know, compared to in my day, they didn't pay that much, you know? So yeah, yeah. That's kind of the, the, the differences and the changes in the playing style. How did you adjust to different playing styles and different cultures while playing and coaching? Um, you know, it, it's playing with um, back when I played with some, uh, the, the African footballers was, you know, Say, for example, you expected the cross to come in first time. If you, if you expected the cross to come in first time, so you make a run and you expected the cross. But what would happen is they would cut the ball back maybe or take another touch or something like that just to try and beat the player they've already beaten another two or three times and get it instead of maybe delivering into the box because it was all about the entertainment for the crowd as well, you know? just doing all the tricks and flicks on the ball. Um, but yeah, the, it's uh, compared to back then to now has changed drastically. Um, but like I said, most of, most, of my, most of what I do on the ball technically is, is what I've learned from playing in, in Africa. Um, again, we used to hold on to the ball longer. It, it was more... Uh, dribbling rather than, hey, let's get one-touch passes involved, uh, moving the ball quickly. So that there's those changes that um, have definitely incurred as the game has evolved. How have you built up your playing career while well, living in South Africa? Was it a challenge or anything? Uh, when I moved from Malawi to South Africa, yeah, um, it was a challenge because I was new to the club uh, that I joined at the time. So, you know, you, you have to work your way in. you at the bottom of the totem pole and prove yourself as a player. And eventually I did, which, which gave me first team opportunities. Um, but, you know, we had to work hard because I, I did play with some very good players. Uh, some of the guys were represented South Africa at a national level. So... Yeah, I mean, uh, the standard and expectations were very, very high. And um, we, we had to stick to that, you know. Um, in the off-season, I used to train um, on my own quite a bit just to maintain my fitness levels because our pre-season was, was hard. I mean, we used to go to the beach. And we used to, I mean, it was all sand dunes and would touch a ball now and again, but it was a lot of, a lot of running. It was... It, for two weeks was it was hard work but and if we went into pre-season unfit then we struggled you know you're behind but you had to keep the standard you had to keep those standards high what were some of your favorite moments playing in south africa 
I'll tell I'll, I'll tell you one which was uh, one of one of my favourite moments. Okay, it was a Sunday game. I'll never forget it. We. I, it was a Thursday or Friday. I was named on the bench to play. And uh, in the first first half, just trying to think, one of our – so one of our players had a – he had a car accident and he just had a slight injury but wasn't that bad. And at half time, he, he couldn't con- – Continue. He told the coach he was he, he just couldn't continue playing, and um, he, he played me as a six um, in the midfield. I was probably about twenty years old at the time, and um, I had to take care of two good um, best games. It was a semi final. The channel uh, I took care of the guy. We ended up what it ended up one one. We were one 0 down at half time, and then we equalised. Yeah, so it, we went to a penalty shootout. Uh, I scored one. Our goalkeeper saved one. I got a lot of praise. From, it was the, the final of the Champion of Champions. And I... So I missed the final, but I'm a little away from it. Um, the ups and downs. But to be honest, that was probably one of the most memorable ones. Uh, it was basically... Uh, going back to it, it, it was <clears throat> I was 20 years old playing for this club in Durban. And um, I'd be named on the t- uh, team sheet and the reserved as, as a substitute for the game. And one, one of our holding midfielders who had an injury couldn't continue at half time. So the coach came to me and he said, This is the role I want you to play as a six. And you put um, I need you to watch this particular player for the opposition. Um, who was a very good player. Uh, also had his national, represented the national team. And I went in there second half, did a job. I continued um, co- continued to play through in extra time and so forth. And we went to penalties. Um, I scored a penalty. Uh, and the, our goalkeeper saved one for us to uh, end up winning the match. And then we went through to... The finals, which were on a Wednesday, and um, we, um, I fell sick on the Tuesday, so I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't end up uh, playing in that game. But yeah, I did, I did get some silverware, you know, and uh, but although I didn't play, so it was. No. So yeah, it was um, that was one of my memorable moments. I mean, I've got, I've got quite a few, but. That was probably one of my best ones. So you talked about being a substitute. So why is it so important for substitutes to be ready to be subbed in at any moment? Yeah, you can be called. You can be called upon at any moment in a game. Um, you know how we w- will warm up at particular moments in the game, um, and then you know just uh, just the importance if you're a substitute. It's very, very important that you are, you know, ready, ready to, to go in and play because you can be called upon at uh, any stage of the game. Uh, you know, your coach has you warming up and warming up and you can warm up for 20 minutes and not be called upon. You might go for another two or three other players to go. That part can be hard. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I had to mentally prepare myself and I was mentally ready, so... You know, then, yeah, just, you know, you, you just got to be ready as a player, as a professional footballer. If it's your profession, you've got to be, it's like anything in life. You, you've got to be ready for maybe the unexpected at times, you know, it might be a different role. But all I wanted to do was play. Um, and at the end of the day, if my coach said to me, hey, I want you to play in this position, these are my reasons, I'll be like, I'm I'm ready. I, anywhere you want me, I'm good to go, you know? So I've done my research a little bit, and I've learned that you've had a few mi- pretty major injuries. So could you talk about recovering from them and any setbacks you've had? Yeah, um, you know, I've had injuries. Uh, I have had an injury play career. So, uh, very, you know, that part of it's unfortunate because I had to 
I had to retire at like 29 years old. So I was young uh, at the time. But, you know, the one injury took me 18 months to recover. Um, that, that was a pretty bad one. But I worked hard at it. I did all the recovery. Um, I came back playing. I stayed motivated. But that was an 18-month recovery. I think, you know, something like that today uh, would be, you know, maybe eight months recovery. With, with, with the, the amount of physical therapy you can go through t uh, in today's age, you know. You know, the science behind recovery today is a lot different to what it was like in the, the late 80s and 90s, that's for sure. How do you support in players going through major injuries? You want, to try and, you want to try and keep them positive because, you know, any injury is, is not, it's not fun. And if, you know, let's say you're playing really well, you've had like eight great games, you're in the starting lineup and bam, all of a sudden you get injured. Let's say it's a high ankle sprain and you're out for six weeks, okay? So you out for six weeks and it's just, you go, okay, so the first thought is I'm not going to play. Second thought is someone else is going to take my position. If that person's taking my position and they're playing well, well, they're going to hold the position. Then, then, it's, then it's a case of, all right, I've got to come back in and I've got to really work hard to win my position back, you see? Um, but, you, but keeping the players motivated is the key so one of my players gets injured i i gotta at least continuously be on them and motivate them into hey this is you know we need to stay positive this is this is a way you can uh you know help this can help with your recovery you know just all all those types of things but you know i know what it's like being injured you do get demotivated but you've you've got to find a way meant from a mentality standpoint from within, how am I gonna how am I gonna stay positive? How you know what am I gonna do to be better? You know, so it's 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 just a it's just a case of trying to encourage the players to continue with their recovery. Um, but it's also up to the player themselves, you know, to to stay motivated, you know. So you had talked about also having to retire pretty young. So yeah. how how did you decide to retire? Well, I, you know, with my injuries, uh, incurring into patella tendonitis and both knees, and it, it was continu It was just painful playing soccer. I just, you know, I it, I just couldn't keep going. I couldn't recover in time as far as injuries go. Um, I think at the end of the day, it it was you know it was a hard decision because it was my life, um, but you know it was also a case of uh, your health. You know, so my health is important, and uh, you know I made the decision and I was done with it at the end of the day. You know, did you know you wanted to coach after retiring? You know, I did a, I did a bit of, a little bit of coaching in South Africa, um, but not to the extent now. And, and yes, I, you know, I've always wanted to, you know, at the end of the day, if you can get paid for doing something you love, then yes. Um, I came out here at 29 years old. Uh, a buddy of mine was the director of coaching for a soccer club in Jackson, Mississippi. I played with him in South Africa and uh, he brought me out. And I haven't really looked back. I did all my coaching education, uh, USSF licensing. I've done all of my education here in the United States. Um, and, you know, I've learned a lot from being here um, off the uh, USSF system. Um, and, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed the process and obviously enjoyed my time here. Was it hard for you to adjust from the playing style in South Africa to to a playing style here in the states? No, not really. Um, because because it was it was all very similar back then, uh, as far as what the playing styles look like. Um, the the hardest part is actually um, acclimatizing to 
coming out off as a player to coaching youth soccer and, and you know if you for example you you have a u11 uh, boys or girls team you know and you're trying to plan your session it's it's a, you know you can't really use what you know as a young coach coming in you can't really use what you've used as a as a player you know so you've got to adapt and you know the other piece as well is you know being a player you you very selfish and you just think of yourself okay um as as a footballer but as a coach you got to think of a whole team you got to think of 18 to 22 selfish players that are just thinking of themselves whether they're going to play on the weekend or not you know so your your whole perspective changes it's not now dealing with yourself you're dealing with 18 to 22 individuals that need loving and let me tell you something it doesn't matter what level you coach at whether it be under 11 boys or girls to college to professional athletes every single player needs loving even your guys that and girls that are getting paid hundred hundred thousand dollars or whatever it might be a week they still need loving and it's and I think that, that 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 message has to be clear because a lot of people think it's great to be a professional footballer, but you know, even those guys and girls need loving. You know, so it, it's it, it's important that um, as a coach, you got to make sure you incorporate everybody and in your communication to the players. Yeah, your communication might be different to certain players and how you communicate your information, but. Um, you can't if you're if you have your 22nd player you've got to treat your 22nd player the same as your first player on a team and i think that's very very important so you're not neglecting any particular players on the team because at the end of the day i mean we've all been there players aren't stupid they can they can figure out information um, you know pretty quickly how do you show players that you care for them? Communication, feedback, constructive criticism. You know, a player players will know if if they've done something wrong, and I turn around and say, "Oh, good job on, on on that particular moment in the game," and it wasn't right. They'll figure out and go like, "Well, I didn't. Really, I want to know what I need to do to make it better." You know, so players. Uh, Players can easily figure out um, if the coach is just sugarcoating information or, or uh, telling the truth. And I think it's always better to tell the truth as a coach and not sugarcoat. So then the information is clear and concise. But then also you have to give the positive feedback to, to reinforce the individual player that they're doing a good job as well. You know, so I, I think that it's a, a whole basis of the communication piece that goes to one collectively, one as an individual and two collectively as a team, as a group. How can you develop other coaches to think about the soft skills? Every coach has a different style, you know, so it's, I, I can't change what, uh, let's say, Manir, how he coaches a team. But uh, what I could do is I could assist him as far as how we, this is what I will do if I'm addressing this particular moment with a player. You know, don't get me wrong. All, play, all coaches work on a different, different uh, a variation of emotional stress during a game. Okay. So when I say that some are really hyper and bouncing up and down, some coaches have a way of controlling their emotions and focusing on on the on the game in particular. Now, if you have a young coach next to you and you're trying to mentor that particular coach, they will always rub off on how you act as a coach on the sideline. If you're bouncing up and down and going crazy and running up and down the sideline, you'll find your assistant coach will be like that or the coach you're mentoring. If you're calm on the sideline, you gather information and you coach your players or your individual players or collectively as a team and you coach them, whoever you are mentoring as a young coach will pick up on that information, you see? 
But it, like I said, every coach is different in their style and the in the way they coach. So you had talked about adapting to different age levels. Was that something that was hard for you at first, or did it take time? Uh. It was hard at first because you, you, your planning changes. You can't do the same training session. Let's say I've got back-to-back -back sessions. Let's say U12s and then U16. I can't do the same session for the U16s that I just did with the U12s. You see? So I, I, can't, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to do that. But um, uh, what I'd have to do is just you know, you, you're on a level, let's say, with the U11s where you've just been on them the whole time trying to keep their attention span up. And then all of a sudden you drained and you're going to your U16 boys session, okay? And you're mentally drained. You've now got to motivate yourself to, to move on to the next session, you know? Uh, I'm used to it now, but in the beginning it, it, it can be difficult. Could you talk about some of your favorite age levels to coach? I know you've coached young kids and adults. Um, put it this way. I don't mind which gender it is. It could be boys or girls. Okay. I have, I have no preference with regards to that. Um, I, do, I, I do like, don't get me wrong, I, I do like the uh, young age groups from a foundational point of view. I, I like to build a foundation. Knowing that if I get that group later on, um, I would be able to coach them knowing, what, knowing that they know the information I've given them. However, I do like coaching from either 14 or 15 up. Uh, I, did, I did enjoy the college level. I did enjoy uh, the menace women's level as well. But, you know, Anywhere from U, U16 through to U19, um, I really enjoy those age groups. What are some of the most memorable, team, memorable, memorable teams or players that you've coached? Huh. You got me here. Uh, yeah. Here's what I... Uh, I don't want to single out players because I, I, you know, I've coached some players that have gone on to uh, play at some level in the USL um, and also gone on to some pretty big schools. And but what I get, what what I get satisfaction out of Anna is is coaching players uh, and then see them graduate from high school, college. And, and to see how successful they, they are and how sex, successful they are doing in, in the work environment, you see, no matter what they do, whether they become soccer coaches or <clears throat> they go out into the work in corporate world or they're traveling, but also to, to, to know that I have had some kind of a touch point uh, or a connection with those particular players at some, some point of my life and, and hoping that I have nurtured them in the, in the correct way with the way I've been coaching them. Young, well, I would say some of them now are in their, in their 30s that I've coached, the guys in Mississippi. But I've had an impact on their lives somewhere along the line, you know. And when, when you receive, when you receive uh, an email or a message at some stage where it's an ex-player that's sent you a message saying, hey, you know, Justin, I, 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 I learned a lot from you, not just as, as from a coaching point of view, but also some of the information you've given me um, to transpire me into just being a, 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 a good human being, you know. Um, as far as teams, I mean, I've, I've, coached, I've coached some teams out there. I've coached some uh, ODP teams, some State Cup winning teams, uh, you know, both here and uh, Mississippi, so you know, it's hard to really single out any t any any teams that I've I've coached. I've coached multiple teams in, in clubs, but I just think it's more the individual satisfaction of of having a, a touch point with players and just to see them progress in their lives and get married and have kids and make me feel as old as I am is uh, 
no, <laughs> as as I'm reaching half a century, yeah, uh, that's that has an impact on my life about how old I'm getting. To be honest with you, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. Could you talk a little bit about your experience coaching collegiately as well? Yeah, I loved it actually. Um, I was at AIB College uh, on the girls' side, on the boys as well, kind of assisted in a volunteer position. And then uh, when the opening for the, the women's job came up, I applied and I, I got the job. My first year was a building process, uh, recruiting players, trying to trying to mold the right players for the squad. We were a small school, so it was challenging. I mean, we were up against Grand View, who offered more than just business when we were just a business school. Um, and then uh, second year, we won the conference, won the conference tournament, and were the first athletic program within the, within the college to qualify for the national tournament. And that's out of all sports. So it was fun. I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed coaching, you know, young adults, which was fun. Uh, the recruiting was fun as well challenging at times but yeah I mean winning that conference uh, title was was pretty awesome you know so and, and it does mean a lot to all the players and the, and the coaching staff who were all a part of the program that helped everybody along I mean and they contributed like tremendously it, it's it, it probably was one of the moments in in my career that's for sure how do you recruit international players? Did you ever struggle with this? No, I, I, I had really good contacts in South Africa. So I got in touch with the uh, South African women's national team coach. Um, she helped me through the recruiting of international players. I pulled in uh, two South African girls who were extremely good. One was a goalkeeper and one was a number 10 attacking midfielder. I uh, had a contact that brought in uh, some Australian players. I also brought in Brazilian players. So I had some good contacts there. I mean, it was, we worked through the process and it was, so at, at times it was easier to bring um, international students in than, you know, recruiting local American girls because of <clears throat> what the program offered a lot of um, American girls. They, they wanted to go to either a bigger school or their main focal point with the academics was nursing, which we didn't offer, you know. So we only offered business and that was it. Um, but yeah, I did. The American girls I did bring in were, were good players. Some had coached at a, a youth level. Um, but it, yeah, it was definitely harder. It was easy to bring in internationals because they really wanted to come to the States and have the college experience here. How did you support international students? They went through the recruit. They went through the process. Uh, you know, the, 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 the two girls that were on the national team uh, were fully scholarship. Uh, but they, they had to pay for their housing. Um, in fact, no, they, they didn't pay for their housing, but their books and, and so forth, they had to pay for. Um, but... You know, we had to go through the whole, all the criteria, the application form and, you know, <laughs> just all, all of that, that whole process, you know, just the financials. And I mean, there was just a whole process to uh, bringing them in the SAT scores and, you know, it's just uh, transferring the high school curriculum grades to what it looked like in the American standards. So uh, that, that part of it, um, but I had a good team behind me in the administration department that basically did all of that work for me. And they would just report to me, you see. I think we've made it to our final question that I ask everyone. So the final right. question is, what do you hope people remember about your impact to soccer and the world? Um, that adds some kind of a touch point um, as a coach. Um, Maybe see me as a nice person, hopefully. Um, maybe I, how I impacted their lives in some way. Uh, not all of them will think that. Um, 
I don't expect 100% at the time. But just, just knowing that I hope that those players that I've, I've coached or had a touch point on, that they feel that I have impacted their lives in a positive, meaningful way moving forward and helping them within, you know, their, uh, their, you know, their upbringing and, you know, their life, you know, moving forward. When I first got ready to do this episode, I thought we might spend a little bit more time on Africa and especially race. Although it wasn't the main part of our conversation, these are important topics to continue to discuss and keep in mind. As I learned more and more about South Africa, I know the country faced many challenges. While some parts of our world, including the U.S., are better today than they were before, we can never stop working in our fight towards equity. I loved when I talked to Justin about some of his favorite memories that right away he said he loved coaching all ages and all genders. This game is a game that is there for all of us, where every player should feel safe and accepted. Until next week, remember to keep the game beautiful.